Welcome to Second Take, the show that focuses on the issues behind the news. Harmony Gold CEO Graham Briggs says new technology in the mining industry has the potential to extend the life of the entire South African gold mining sector. Mining Weekly editor Martin Creamer tells us more. Welcome, Martin. Thanks, Shannon. Now, Graham Briggs seems um, keen for Harmony to adopt the new technology that Anglo Gold Ashanti has developed for its Kusa Saletu mine. Yes, uh, you know, this technology really is, has come in the nick of time. You have these uh, gold mines at the moment uh, on the brink of collapse, you know, um, from a, a global point of view, especially in the dollar pricing of it, not so much the rand pricing of gold, but when you look at the dollar price. So the world over, you know, there are huge cutbacks in gold. Along comes this technology, you know, answer to a maiden's prayer, because um, the horizon of our gold mines would have been severely shortened had this not arrived. We used to drill and blast, which shakes the mine up and which uh, makes it unsafe, really. Along comes this non-blast technology, boring technology, a sort of an automated approach that um, means that you can actually mine continuously. You know, you don't have to leave the mine after you have drilled and placed your blasting explosives because uh, you can't be in that mine when that explosion goes mm -hmm. off. You've got to be out of it. And then there's a time, a settling time as well, where you have to stay out of the mine. The cleaning process uh, comes a bit later when everything's settled down. And then the miners return the next day, drill again, put the explosives into position and leave the mine and detonate you know, once they're on surface. So it's changing the whole pattern of, of mining. It's going for mechanical cutting, you know, rather than a chemical approach, which uh, worsens the safety prospects. But it's interesting that these companies can work together because, you know, the history of mining in South Africa, the various companies have not collaborated to any great extent. They would work at the Chamber of Mines on certain collective issues, but technology would have been the jealous preserve of one of them. Whereas I think, um, you know, the magnanimous approach of, of Anglo Gold Ashanti, it works on this technology, it introduces the technology, it puts it through its paces, it sees that it's really revolutionary, and then says, we don't want to take it for ourselves, we'll call it South African technology. Mm -hmm. And anyone with a hard rock or body like we've got, be it gold, be it platinum, you know, they can make use of this because it is going to be uh, in the custodianship of the commercial sector. And it uses backfilling rather than the blasting, as you mentioned. And you know, the funny thing about this is that people tell me that when they went through the archives, they found paperwork going back to the 70s, which actually had cracked this code. They had actually introduced this concept and uh, were going to build prototypes and the rest. But they said the snag was that they couldn't have the backfill. They needed this high density backfill. Looking back on it now, a lot of them start interrogating that and saying, you know, wasn't, weren't there other reasons because, you know, backfill isn't unsurmountable. And um, as you say now, you've got to deceive Mother Nature. You remove that gold, and before Mother Nature knows that you've taken it out, you fill that cavity with high density backfill, and it's as good as the rock. Briggs also says the technology could be the only solution for South Africa's gold mines in the future. Yes, you know, initially they're saying when you mine these days, you have to leave, well, the tradition is you leave pillars. You leave big pillars, which is really gold. You're leaving ore body. <laughs> You're leaving gold-bearing rock to hold up the roof, as it were. Uh, and, and then you, you mine in such a way that um, you mine in the gaps between those supports. What this can do, this technology, is you can come back and mine those pillars, which are very rich. Mm -hmm. And because you're only going to take the gold-bearing rock out of there and not any waste, your grades become mouth-watering. You know, they can go up to 25 grams a ton, which we're not used to here. Mm -hmm. And you can do that continuously, you know, 24 hours a day, which we're not used to here. You know, we get uh, very few hours in, uh, 10 hours maximum. and, and um, <coughs> also, we, we, we're not used to this continuous mining of 365 days a year, which they do everywhere else in the world. Mm. This sort of technology enables you to get back to those pillars, 
to mine those pillars safely, but it also allows you to go to the ultra deeps. And when we're talking ultra deeps, we know that uh, you know uh, we have the deepest mines in the world, mm. and Impaneng is at that four kilometer level. But they're saying you know you can go to five kilometers, five and a half kilometers, six kilometers using this technology. You won't want people down there, and that's why this is a leap over mechanization into automation. And so it can prolong the lives of our minds here. And we know how important they are. You know, even with gold down, at last count, we still earned more from exports, from gold, than anything else. It, it is a crucial part of our economy. We're only sitting here because of gold. You know, it's like uh, San Francisco and these other places built on a metal. Mm -hmm. We built on gold here. And <clears throat> that's why they want to keep this going for as long as possible. And, and when you examine it, a place like uh, Harmony is saying, you know, we've got a mine, Kusasa Letu. We've got, well, they say 22 years of life. I saw the official figure, 27 years of life at Kusasa Letu. They're saying that life can be doubled with this technology because <clears throat> the, the, the amount of gold you can get out of those um, pillars, the support pillars, uh, is now equal to what they are, have got in their reserves. So that would be a resource, and they've already got a reserve, and that equals the reserve. So you double the life of mine. But the other benefit <laughs> is that you don't have to drag out that tonnage that you do in your normal mining. You, your tonnage is less, your costs are less, and your mining is continuous. So it's like having money on tap. You know, it's going to pour out of there. It will really assist the revenue. Talking about money on tap, though, their results seem to have taken a bit of a knock because of the strikes. Kusasu let particularly let the side down. You know, <clears throat> as Graham Briggs says, look, the dollar price of gold looks terrible. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the rand price, you know, he's saying he can be sustainable at 400,000 rand a kilogram. They always measure it in kilograms when you come to rands. They don't talk about the ounces. Kilograms. Uh, he says he's sustainable <coughs> at 400,000 um, around a kilogram, but if you look at some of his costs, it's Kusasu it's more like 327,000 rand uh, cost per kilogram to 350,000 rand per kilogram, and he's been getting, you know, 470,000 rand per kilogram, 427 rand per kilogram. So he's in the money, mm -hmm. you know, he's in the money. Where he, they fell down badly was through the strike. Mm -hmm. The strike broke their kneecaps because Kusasu Letu only mined, well, it mined less than half of what it normally does. If Kusasu Leto had come to the party, they wouldn't have had losses. There would have been probably, there would have been dividends, I'm sure. So a lot of people are suffering as a result of these strikes. I don't know whether the miners actually know what sort of damage they do when they go on these wildcat strikes. We do have a framework, you know, where you can strike. You can strike legitimately. If you've got legitimate grievances, you reach a deadlock. Where it becomes horrific, is when it's unplanned. Mm -hmm. and, and so they can't build stockpiles, they, you know, they can't keep the plant going, and the country suffers mm -hmm. severely. It affects pensions. And pensions, mm -hmm. because most of the investment in the South Africa's mining industry, pension funds, provident funds. So <clears throat> that whole story about, oh, they're gonna nationalize the mines. I mean, I think if they had done that, our Johannesburg Stock Exchange would have collapsed to zero. So you'd have had a zero <laughs> value in that exchange. Mm. Pensioners would have been sitting there, including mine workers. How does that but my pension's gone? <laughs> it's just evaporated. Mm. And I think they would have marched off to those ANC youth and said, hey, are you gonna give us money now? <laughs> because it's all gone. And so it is a key link. You know, most of the investment in the world today is, is from these pension and provident funds, particularly in the mining industry. That's why, you know, when the Chileans said, oh, they're gonna engage in nationalization by stealth last year, and they said they were gonna seize the copper assets of Anglo-American. You know, our diplomats went banging on that door and said, hey, you know, you're harming us here. <laughs> you're harming our ordinary working guys. You're gonna rip them off. You know, if you wanna take that, you must pay for it. <laughs> you can't just, well, they were going to take it, but they were going to pay a pittance. Mm. And uh, you notice Chile backed off because they suddenly realized, you know, the world is interconnected here. 
there are pension funds sitting in South Africa which will be damaged by what we do here, this nationalization by stealth. Mm. And they backed off, thank goodness. Mm. Well, thank you very much for your insight, Martin. Uh, it's a great pleasure, Shannon. That's the show for today. Join us again next time for more news and insight into what's happening in the mining world.